Thanks, everybody. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Put my green on for you. Um, I just, uh, I'm, I'm so happy to be able to talk to you today about uh, one of my favorite uh, discoveries here in Decatur um, in, uh, in the Morgan County Archives, Miss Lelia Seton Wilder Edmondson. Uh, she truly is a fascinating person, and it's fitting that uh, we get to honor her here during Women's History Month. Uh, because um, she's so little known, um, although during her day, she was uh, widely uh, hailed as one of the more influential women in the state. And uh, certainly um, she sold newspapers. People want to hear about what she was doing. Um, uh, but I have to admit that uh, in my own experience, I did not know about her until uh, I was looking through some postcards uh, at the archives, and I noticed one that was a photograph of the uh, old state bank in Decatur that mentioned, it's, it, the caption was, uh, Lelia Cantwell Seton Hall. And I started asking people, I said, who is this person? I've never heard of her. And uh, there weren't too many good answers. Uh, somebody said, well, I believe down at the... Uh, Episcopal Church. There's a couple of windows that are dedicated and have her name on. But anyway, I didn't really find out more about her until, until we started going through our old newspaper systematically, and she started coming up. And uh, I learned the full scope of just how, what an interesting person she was. Um, she actually um, was remarkable for, uh, of course, her, uh, her career. Um, she was a successful real estate speculator. She made a fortune in real estate in uh, the Decatur area. Uh, she was a um, modern agriculturalist. She was a true progressive farmer in every sense of the word. Um, she took uh, a lot of modern methods and applied to her farm. And uh, it was actually, it actually became a model, uh, a model farm. And I'll tell you more about that later. Uh, she traveled the world. She was, uh, her, her, her travels were documented in newspapers, picked up in wire stories across the country. Uh, when she would go out, she, was, uh, she would tell people about uh, the situation in Alabama and her opinion was well sought after. And she was just a colorful uh, person full of quips and humor. But then uh, the thing that we most remember her for now is that she was a 1922 candidate for the 8th Congressional District in North Alabama. Um, this made her actually the first woman from Alabama to run for Congress and one of only 11 that year uh, in that first year that women could run for federal office. So uh, pretty, pretty uh, um, interesting uh, story there. We'll get more into that. She also, of course, advocated for women's suffrage uh, and for the rights of farmers and for uh, farmers' causes. Um, a little bit of background on this remarkable woman. Um, she was born in Olivesburg, Ohio in 1861. Her father was uh, a man named Captain uh, William H. Seaton, and he was a military man. Uh, he had served in the Mexican War, and he also was, at the time, uh, at the time she was born, he was a captain in the 26th Ohio Infantry. Um, when she was still a baby, uh, you know, of course, he was serving during the war, and in 1864, he was at Chickamauga and uh, wounded, and because of his wounds, he was sent uh, back home to convalesce, and he never recovered from those wounds. He died in December of 1864. So uh, her mother, Ra Rachel, uh, and, uh, and Lelia were left on their own, and apparently they did not have much of a support network there in Ohio. We know that she rather quickly named, uh, married a man named James Horton uh, in 1866, and um, there was a child of that marriage as well, Roy Horton, who was uh, Lelia's uh, much-beloved uh, half-brother. Um, at some point, the family does move to Decatur sometime before 1870 because they show up in the, in the, in the census then. And uh, we're not quite sure what brought them there, but I believe it was because uh, uh, Rachel's uncle, uh, Dr. D.D. D. Cantwell, uh, who was an, uh, an owner of uh, a lot of real estate there in the city of Decatur, 
Um, I have not been able to find his military record, but he was very uh, active in the Union League. Uh, he knew most of the power players, most of the Northerners who were there in Decatur at the time. Um, some folks would call some of these folks carpetbaggers, but uh, I think a lot of them uh, uh, genuinely were industrialists and people there trying to, to, uh, to develop the area. Uh, but uh, Dr. Cantwell actually owned and lived in the old state bank in Decatur, Alabama. So this is the most recognizable symbol of Decatur. If you've ever been there, it's still, the bank still stands. The 1832 structure that was uh, the old state bank um, and uh, served many purposes all uh, throughout the 19th century and currently it's a museum. But uh, at the time, Dr. Cantwell owned it and lived in it. Um, we're not sure uh, about uh, James. Uh, we know that in 1880, the census, it said that James Horton was a farm worker. Uh, so we, I don't think he was a very ambitious type fellow. Um, and at some point he, uh, he passed away. And it seems that at that time, that's when the family actually moved in with Dr. Cantwell in the old state bank building. Uh, now Lelia was a, a bright child and uh, Dr. Cantwell wanted to uh, give her a proper education. So he sent her to Memphis, uh, where she went to school. And uh, she went to school there all throughout the 1870s. And uh, in 1879, she actually graduated at the top of her class uh, from a high school in Memphis and returned to Decatur. And we don't know much about uh, what happened then, but uh, at some point there was a a gentleman that she met, uh, another uh, fellow Ohioan, a man named Charles Rollin Wilder. Now, uh, Charles Rollin Wilder was a, a one of many uh, Northern investors who came to North Alabama in the Decatur area. A lot of them actually had been uh, servicemen who had served uh, in the Decatur area in the Union Army during the war. He was not. He was just a man from Cincinnati. Uh, he's listed as a real estate developer in uh, in census and he's one of these folks who came down to try his hand as a cotton farmer and he actually uh, came with a fat wad of cash his family had given him and he actually was able to buy one of the most extensive plantations in the area um, what he bought was formerly the Henry Rhodes estate. If any of you who may know about uh, Decatur, Alabama, know Dr. Henry Rhodes was one of the earliest uh, pioneers of the area and one of the founders of Decatur. But um, sort of, this is Albany, this is old Decatur. So we're talking about this whole area here, all up and down the Tennessee River and butting up against the city of Albany here. Um, and it was about 1,700 acres. And uh, it was a... He, he bought this. It was in mostly in cotton cultivation, but the, the farm had been sadly neglected uh, during the war and the post-war years. So it was in fairly rough shape. So I think uh, Mr. Wilder had some good instincts about land that would be valuable, but he didn't really know much more than real estate. He certainly did not know farming. Uh, he rang, uh, ran up a lot of debt um, in a very short time um, trying to make a go of this uh, farm. I think he probably also was a wheeler dealer who was leveraging a lot of uh, a, a lot of things to speculate in real estate. And as a result, um, you know, he was back and forth to Cincinnati. But as a result, uh, he actually, um, he was, well, I, I need to go on and say he met and married Lelia. Uh, they married in uh, 1883. So um, they did not have any children from that marriage. Uh, he had three children from a previous marriage. But when he passed away, um, he left a mountain of debt, and Lelia was left as the executor of that estate. Uh, he had over $15,000 in debt at that time and no cash on hand. Uh, so the first thing she had to do was uh, sell all the personal uh, effects of the house, and um, sell all the farming implements, anything that she could do to raise the capital. And then uh, it's funny, uh, she was actually corresponding with the probate judge. We know very little about Lelia. We don't have a lot of her own personal writings because there was a fire in the house uh, many years later, but we do have what's in the files of the Morgan County Archives when her mother and when her husband passed away. And in this file of Charles Rawlins' uh, 
file when he when he died after he died in uh, 1885. She wrote to the uh, probate judge E.M. Russell talking about how the debtors were after her. Uh, excuse me, the creditors were after her, and uh, how she how she just uh, you know was left with almost nothing. And at the end, she just sort of quips, showing her great sense of humor. She says. Uh, they would not even allow me a year's ration of corn, although I told them how much I love cornbread. So she, she she could see the humor in the situation, even though she was in a tough spot. But um, it, she actually was uh, very fortunate, however, in the timing of this calamity, because it just so happened at that time, this is when the Decatur Land Improvement and Furnace Company uh, was buying up huge tracts of land in and around Decatur uh, to develop for what they believed would be the Chicago of the South. Um, that's another saying. If you go up to Decatur, you'll hear that a few times to describe this era, Decatur's big boom time. And they actually created something called New Decatur. This is a much later map that shows it as Albany. That was in uh, at 1915 when the name changed to Albany. But we had two cities, the city of Old Decatur and the city of New Decatur. And New Decatur was laid out in a modern plan with a park system and a new water and sewage system. Uh, there was going to be an electric plant there and uh, trolley lines and commuter rail. And some of this, you know, a great deal of it actually came to pass. And uh, they did actually sell a lot of real estate uh, along the river to uh, in industries. And so uh, a lot of these people who were pouring money into the success of Decatur at this time, um, actually in this year of 1887 to 1888, the population just quintupled, I think, uh, went to about from about 1,000 to about 5,000 or more. And so uh, it really looked like a safe bet to pour money into Decatur. Uh, it had Decatur had a lot of advantages. You know, there was untapped timber. Uh, it was believed that there was petroleum there in the country. Uh, we also had, of course, the location on the Tennessee River. And at the um, conjunction of two rail lines, uh, the L&N and, and uh, the Memphis and Charleston. So it was a very, very advantageous uh, place for industry. So uh, it just so happened that she had this land that she had to sell at this time when prices were very high. It was definitely a seller's market. And uh, a man named Hiram Bond of New York City, who was uh, a banker and an investor uh, of the highest caliber, actually bought her land for $40,000, the Wilder Place, so it was called. Um, and so because it was so uniquely situated on the waterfront there where industry would be located, he thought that was a safe bet. So uh, Bond bought that. At some point, he sells it to uh, Major E.C. Gordon of Limestone County. Gordon himself was another a big New South man. You'll see him listed as uh, on the board of directors for a lot of companies, you know, uh, Tennessee Co uh, Coal and Iron and uh, also a lot of railroads. Uh, he ends up after this going on and building railroads out west. But uh, Major Gordon um, is the person who owns the land when, unfortunately, the bottom falls out of the Decatur market, the bubble bursts, because we're uh, faced with a yellow fever epidemic in 1888. So all the literature that they had been promoting that this is such a healthful climate and it's so wonderful and everything's going to be great in Decatur, uh, they begin to discover, well, you're also surrounded by swampland and subject to floods and all this. And so it's a good spot for malaria, typhoid, uh, and yellow fever. So the market kind of, the bubble bursts. So Major Gordon and a lot of the other investors are left with a lot of land that hasn't been developed yet. So what are you going to do with this? Well, um, like I said, Lelia knew what she was doing and she was in the right place at the right time. Whether she was just very good friends with Major Gordon and the other directors, we don't know. But I know that she actually was able to uh, buy a lot of the land back from Major Gordon. The deed says for a dollar. So um, we're not sure what other, might, what other things may have transpired there. She buys another tract of it for $10,000. But Basically, what happens, you know, to put a make a long story short, she sold for forty thousand dollars and bought it back for ten thousand dollars, and so, um, you know, a lot of people would have, you know, said this is great, this is a great opportunity. I'm going to go live the rest of my days on the coast or whatever. Um, 
but she, uh, she wasn't that type of person and she wanted to actually turn this farm around. So she begins to pour funding back into the Wilder Place, as it's called. It's still called by some of the old timers, the Wilder Place. And uh, even though Charles Rowland Wilder didn't really own it for a very long time, but she, uh, she actually did. She started to modernize the farm. She, uh, let's see, let me go on to the next file there so you can see. Yeah, here's a, here's a map of uh, the Decatur Land Improvement and Furnace Company's developments in and around Decatur. And her lands would have been situated right off the map here. This is Major E.C. Gordon that I was discussing. Um, but yeah, so she, uh, oh, oh yeah, and I forgot to mention also when her mother died, when Lelia's mother died in 1888, um, she inherited Dr. Cantwell's uh, real estate holdings as well. So she's sitting pretty in Decatur at the time, uh, including the old state bank building. But um, at any rate, so she's, she's left with um, uh, this, this campaign to modernize a farm. She's paying attention to what Dr. Carver's writing. She's doing the crop rotation. She's buying modern cultivators. She's fertilizing. Uh, she's doing all the things that you should do. Uh, and she also um, is a great proponent of education uh, and learning about the most modern methods. Uh, she is very big on cotton cultivation, uh, as most of her peers were, that cotton pays the bills. So although they were raising lots of other crops on the plantation, it was, it was certainly mostly, uh, mostly cotton. Um, now, the thing that she begins to gain a real notoriety for is her relationship with her tenants, uh, who at this time were almost exclusively African American. She has about 160 people living on the on the plantation at the time, and um, she is sought after because she does gain success. She doesn't have a lot of turnover there. A lot of her contemporaries are complaining about it's difficult to keep workers. It's difficult. They're they're attracted by the wages in the cities. They're uh, they go other places. What is it that you do that's different? And basically, it seems to me that it just on a very general level, she treats them with respect and gives them uh, sort of uh, what they're due. She doesn't cheat them, uh, at least not where I could see. Her views, it's, it's very, um, there's an article in uh, the Salt Lake Herald in, in August of 1906, where she's traveling through Salt Lake City, Utah, and they interview her. And she's explaining um, uh, how she's uh, how her how she relates to her tenants, and she does speak in a lot of terms that would be you know considered racist today. Uh, but you know, as we know, if anyone who studied the Progressive Era, that's not uncommon. But she does um, she is friends with Booker T. Washington. She's friends with a lot of the uh, more prominent black families, and basically. She, to put it in a, in a, in a um, to put it in shorthand, she believes that the uh, whatever shortcomings she believes that her tenants have, she believes that's because uh, they're so shortly removed from the institution of slavery. She does not believe there's any genetic uh, shortcomings in uh, African Americans. She, that it's actually just because they're so close to the institution of slavery, and that they have to learn to stand on their own. So she's very much in that model of Booker T. Washington, um, the colony movement in the South. And she believes that, um, you know, with education, these people are gonna be um, every bit as productive as anybody else. One of the interesting things in this article, the, and I wanted to try to read you this, was uh, it's interesting that she mentions Herschel Vivian Cashin. I don't know if any of you are uh, aware of uh, the Cashin family in North Alabama. Some of them are in Huntsville as well, but they're an African American family who's very highly connected. Uh, uh, Herschel Vivian Cashin is actually the director of the Huntsville, the federal land office, and a receiver of public monies. So, uh, but he actually she quotes him in this. She says, uh, uh, he, she speaking of Dr. Cashin, she says he's one of the uh, ablest Negroes in the state. He believes that this is only a reaction from slavery that freedom affects a Negro just as a white man would be affected by suddenly coming into a vast fortune. Uh, he's spendthrift with his money and his freedom. Cashin believes that another generation will settle down to the serious task of life and be more industrious and better citizens. 
So, you know, it's it's sort of a backhanded compliment in a way, but I think she's, in, in a way, she's saying that they just have to find their way. And with a little help, they, they will. Um, and the main thing that she does, uh, that she, one reason that she says that they stick with her is because she pays very good attention to their school. She built a school for her tenants, uh, for her tenants' children there, and she always made sure she got a good instructor. Uh, she was very um, particular about that. Uh, and she actually, um, she actually uh, quotes several times the, um, some of the educators who, who talk about the, the eagerness of these children. And she says that she's spoken to a lot of her tenants, and it's important for them, especially to parents who could not read or write, that their children could. And she said that this is an inducement for them to actually stay uh, on her land. Um, furthermore, um, she does run a, a commissary store on a plantation, as many people who worked under the sharecropping system did. Um, but uh, she was very careful. Of course, it sounds like a busybody into everybody's business, but she was uh, very careful to look over the account books. And when she saw a tenant was spending an unreasonable amount buying things that maybe she knew they would not be able to afford, she would go and personally speak to them and say, "This, your money's not going to last. And she would do this. Uh, and again, she's telling people about this. So, I mean, I, I guess it could be embarrassing for some of these folks. But at the same time, at the end of the year, her sharecroppers actually see some money at the end of the year, whereas a lot of sharecroppers across the South were caught in an endless cycle of debt because they owed more at the end of the year than, uh, than what they uh, could pay for. So it's, in, it's, it's just very interesting to see uh, her, her views on race and on, uh, on, these, uh, on, the, um, on the politics of the day and her optimism. Well, she, uh, she does go on. Let me see here. Okay, yeah. So this is a little bit about, um, this is, oh, okay. Actually should have shown you this this earlier. But uh, this is a photograph of Lelia from this area, uh, this era, um, when she was featured in Leslie's Weekly as the cotton queen of Alabama. So she's getting stories written about her in Leslie's Weekly and Harper's in uh, the New York Times, Chicago newspapers. This is a famous postcard. These pop up from now and again. And as you see, it says Negro Cabin Wilder Plantation, New Decatur, Alabama. And there are a number of these that show sort of scenes of life because this plantation is that famous now that it's actually appearing on postcards. Um, and she's sort of holding, held up as a model of, of uh, how to treat uh, workers and how to re retain them. Um, let me, excuse me. Okay, yeah, so she has a great amount of success. success. Um, she has record yields. She gets a lot of the first bale of cotton, uh, which is a big deal. Uh, that she brings in and they take her picture and she's gotten the first bale of cotton. Um, and she's a great self-promoter. She takes every one of these little victories and makes sure everybody knows about it. Um, she never turns down an interview. Uh, she's always uh, she's always on the move, and uh, she looks for little causes to uh, to latch on to. And uh, one of these is uh, she raises money for a silver set for the USS Alabama, the battleship. You know when you know the Great White Fleet and all this. Uh, she she wants to make sure that everyone knows that. Alabama is going to grace the ship that bears her name. Uh, she gets school children everywhere to raise little pennies and things for this project. She also is Alabama's representative to the Paris Exposition. Uh, so that's a, a big feather in her cap. Um, she's just always looking for uh, ways to represent the state and to insinuate herself as a representative of the state. So uh, she's, like I said, she, she did not need a PR person. She was her own PR person. And in 1910, she, one of her more important uh, promotional ideas is that she uh, leverages her friendship with Senator John Bankhead to persuade the U.S. Department of Agriculture to set up a demonstration station on her farm. And so they would have monthly demonstrations for the local farmers, uh, both black and white, I believe, uh, that would um, 
show modern methods of farming and also teaching uh, teaching the um, the homemakers on these farms different things like canning and making mattresses and things like this. Uh, so uh, she's actually uh, gets a lot of notoriety for this as well. And uh, her demonstration hog farm, which was started in 1911, was the first of its kind in the United States. Now, these early programs actually provide models for a lot of the future uh, agricultural extension programs in the state. So she's, she's very important in this regard as well. Um, so she's as busy as she is and with her world travels and everything, she, uh, she, you wouldn't think she would have time for romance and no one else thought she did either. And then all of a sudden uh, in 1912, uh, she elopes with uh, Wallace B. Edmondson, Colonel Edmondson, who's from a wealthy Tennessee family. It shocked everyone. Their families didn't know anything about it. Nobody indicator knew anything about it. They didn't even know they were seeing each other. Um, he was supposed to be um, visiting uh, relatives in Oklahoma, and she was going up to New York City on business. In fact, they both went to New York City, were married there, and went on a cruise to London afterwards. Uh, so that's the photograph from their passport at this time. But uh, uh, Mr. Edmondson had moved there in, into Decatur in uh, 1904. Uh, he was a state manager for the American Central Life Insurance Company. Um, and he's a little long in the tooth, but I, I, you know, and I think a lot of her, um, a lot of his family, one reason they may have kept this secret was she knew that his family did not approve. Uh, she was not known as this very much of a ladylike lady, I think. And, uh, and Colonel Edmondson was definitely very, very old South. And I think uh, that may have had something to do with it. I know that to this day, some of their, uh, some of the Edmondson family descendants uh, still don't speak very highly of, of, of Lilia. So, <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know the full story there. Um, this is this is their home over here. Uh, this is the um, so-called Wilder place. Uh, this photograph was actually provided to us from um, a, a family that came from one of the white tenants. About 1915, um, we see white families moving to be tenants on the Wilder farm as well. And uh, this was uh, from a family named Har of Harden Hughes who later himself became successful in real estate in Decatur. But uh, this shows you the home. It was built, we think, about 1846. Uh, so it was, um, you know, a very important house there. Uh, and uh, too bad it's not around, but I'll tell you a little more about that later. Um, so there, they host a lot of parties there. Um, uh, Mr. Edmondson doesn't seem to be doing too much. He retires in 1918. Um, in a 1938 report of the Citizens Historical Association states that his hobbies include in playing stud poker and breeding hogs. So he's just not doing, you know, he's le leaving all the business to his wife. Um, according to Lely's obituary, in 1920, when the price of cotton was down to 10 cents a pound in this country, Mrs. Edmondson went to Europe and sold 400 bales of cotton in Italy at 40 cents a pound. So this is the kind of thing that she would do, um, just, you know, get the idea to do it. Um, she also, in 1916, this is interesting, uh, allowed a motion picture to be filmed uh, on her farm. So I don't know what it is. You know, we, that's the only reference we see to it in one of the newspapers. But, you know, uh, so many of those have been lost to, to, to history anyway. But... It's just uh, interesting, the, the different things that she had going on. Whatever was new and modern, she wanted to be a part of it. Um, she had a flying circus perform, you know, in the very early days of aviation, performed on the, uh, on the farm, and everyone from Decatur came out to the farm to see this, uh, the, the barnstormers and the flying circus with the old biplanes and such. So anyway, interesting stuff about Lelia and her, and her life on the farm. But, um, of course, we know her best today uh, as a politician. Now, it's interesting. I heard uh, it was wonderful. I heard a little bit of Scotty's talk in the gallery upstairs uh, about um, women's uh, suffrage here in Alabama. And Decatur actually had um, quite a prestigious record in that regard. Um, a few years earlier in the 1890s, uh, Ella Hildreth had, um, of Decatur had um, established one of the very first women's suffrage clubs in the state. And she also 
uh, had Susan B. Anthony and Cher Carrie Chapman Catt to come speak there. So uh, Decatur had this core of women who were active in thinking in, along these lines, women, women's rights. Of course, we had the flip side of that, the women who wanted to keep women out of politics and were afraid that it would uh, lead to African-American voting rights. So there were a lot of, uh, a lot of activity there in Decatur, but there was this core group that was uh, definitely uh, for women's suffrage. Now, Lelia actually was a little bit ambivalent on that. Uh, to begin with. Um, and in 1899, as a matter of fact, she actually claimed in a New York Post interview not to be interested in the suffrage fight. Uh, quote, she said, no, I am not a suffragist or a club woman. I haven't time for clubs and I can always find two or three men who will vote for me. So that just shows you a little bit of how uh, she looked at things. But again, how much of this is what she really thinks and how much is this public persona that she's built up? Um, but we know that she definitely changed her position rather strongly after the passage of the 19th Amendment, if not before, because she becomes a, the founder, one of the founders of the Morgan County League of Women Voters in 1920. And from that point on, she's extremely active in politics. Um, so much so that in 1922, she decides to run for Congress. Um, she's one of 11 across the nation and the only one in Alabama. She's running against uh, Edward B. Allman, who's the incumbent there in the 8th District, uh, for the Democratic uh, nomination, which, of course, in Alabama at that time was the election. Uh, so she's, uh, she, curiously enough, does not uh, mention women's rights in her campaign that I have been able to find. She talks about being a farmer for the farm. So she's going for the brass ring. She's, this is not a novelty to her. She thinks she can speak directly to North Alabama farmers. And um, she's got the record. You know, she's built up this reputation over time that she is a successful farmer. And what she has to say is worth listening to. Um, she gets involved in the executive committee of the National Farmers Union. And uh, so she becomes uh, very well known. And, and it's interesting, you know, to some of the causes the Farmers Union has been associated with uh, that she would um, she would go on with that. Um, you know, they actually uh, I know the Farmers Union uh, was in favor of the direct election of senators in favor of women's rights and suffrage, uh, the Federal Farm Loan Act. So all these things are things that she's advocating for in her campaign. And she says Edward B. Allman, he's from a rich Lawrence County family. He was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He never worked a day in his life. Of course, I don't know how much she actually worked. I mean, she told people what to do. But uh, anyway, but she did certainly know the ins and outs of running a farm. And it seems to have gone pretty far for her. You know, she talks about good roads, fertilizer, river navigation, easier credit for farmers. And uh, there's a lot of press at her speeches when she goes around and speaks in North Alabama. In the end, she does lose um, by uh, 3,204 to 1,070. But even that is a victory for her because Allman said he was going to easily beat her by the margin of eight to one. So, you know, it was a real campaign. Uh, and in fact, there, I, I found a few precincts, even within Morgan County, where she took the precinct. She actually beat Allman in some of these. So uh, pretty good for the first election that a woman uh, ran in for Congress in, in Alabama. Um, but she does not, she doesn't just leave it there. She stays involved in politics. Like I said, she was in the, uh, the farmers union. She was on their executive, uh, committee. And on that, in that regard, she goes in 1924 to Washington, DC to speak on behalf of, uh, Henry Ford's plan for the Wilson Dam. A lot of you are aware of this, uh, you know, the Ford city plan. Uh, basically, Wilson Dam had been started during World War I to produce nitrates uh, for the war effort for gunpowder. Uh, and Ford says he can turn it around and uh, produce fertilizer for farmers. And this is really a big part of why Lelia is interested in it. For all I know, she also had some uh, land there in the Muscle Shoals area, which she very well may have, uh, knowing her. But uh, we don't, I don't have that uh, evidence. But, but anyway, of course, uh, you know, Ford has bragged that he would have a million jobs in, uh, in a city 75 miles long. And so a lot of people are, this is appealing to a lot of farmers, um, especially. 
in North Alabama who want to see this land developed and want to see the Tennessee River tamed and uh, get this cheap fertilizer. Um, so she goes to Washington and she's in the Senate hearings. Um, the main person who's against this in the Senate is uh, Senator George Norris of Nebraska. He eventually is the person who pretty much gets this bill killed. But uh, George Norris, uh, excuse me just a second. So he's questioning her one day in the hearing, in the committee room. And she, and she says, well, you know, I know that you said that you would support this plan. He said, I've never done so, any such thing. She says, well, don't you remember uh, you were in the shoals and there was, a, and someone said, what's it going to take you to support the Ford plan? And he said, how about a kiss from one of these girls? You know, just a lighthearted. And sure enough, one of these pretty high school girls gets up and kisses him on the cheek. And she brings this story up in the, uh, in the, um, in the committee meeting and, Senator Norris is not pleased. He turns red faced and blusters and says, well, how dare you uh, um, impugn my honor or whatever. And, and he goes on and on about this and makes quite a fool of himself. And so for the next few days, he's the laughing stock of Washington. And everyone's, you know, you want to kiss George and all this stuff. Uh, but uh, so she he was not a fan uh, of Mrs. Uh, Edmondson's. Anyway, he does end up killing that bill. Doesn't happen. And it's all probably for the best because, of course, we know TVA starts a few years later. But um, that actually leads us sort of to the uh, to the next chapter in her life. And this picture, by the way, this just says it all as far as. Uh, this is a, I'll give a quick note about this, this photograph. It actually came to us from the files of one of the Birmingham newspapers. They didn't know who it was. It was just stuck in a file that said Morgan County. And for years it was misidentified. And uh, actually when I took one look at her, having seen the photographs of her and Singer posing with the cotton, I said, that's, that's Mrs. Edmondson. And uh, the, you know, the face is, you know, I didn't, and just the, her posture here, you know, she's in charge. Uh, she doesn't care what you think. You know, it's just uh, it just says it all about her character. But um, it, she, you know, she changed gears. She didn't have uh, any hurt feelings about the end of the Ford plan. And when uh, when uh, FDR comes into office and be begins promoting the New Deal, she's all for it. And even the TVA, um, she ends up losing a good portion of her lands. Uh, they're appropriated about. Uh, somewhere between a third and half of her lands are taken by TVA at that time. Um, and, uh, but she's, she's sort of beginning to contract the farming game anyway. She's selling pieces of the land off, um, but she gladly does it. You know, uh, she, she's, she's a supporter of FDRs. Um, and she actually um, also, uh, she reduces her cotton acreage voluntarily in 1933 when uh, they want um, farmers to reduce this so the prices can raise during uh, the depression. She does that without complaining about it at all. She goes from 700 acres to 340 acres in cultivation. Um, it also probably helps that Henry Wallace was her cousin. Henry Wallace's father, uh, um, excuse me, Henry Wallace's grandmother was a Cantwell, just like Lelia's mother was a Cantwell. And so they were they had the same roots back there. And actually, Henry Wallace, while he's Secretary of Agriculture, does come and visit uh, Lelia Seaton Wilder and uh, Edmondson at their home. And, uh, and he, uh, he talks about how uh, wonderful the demonstration farm is there. And she's constantly lobbying him for the, you know, the, uh, for the different help, for the different things that they can do for, uh, for the farmers and continuing the agricultural extension classes. Um, but she does, um, like I said, she continues to uh, be a booster for the area um, when, of course, I'm sure it helped her as well. Uh, when Wolverine Tube comes uh, to Decatur, uh, this is a division of Calumet and Hecla that made copper tubing. Um, she doesn't uh, really play hardball with them because she wants them to build the plant and, and have jobs there for um, for the people in Decatur. Um, Colonel Edmondson dies in 1938, and by all accounts, even though we, we don't know much about him, uh, this broke her heart, truly. Uh, most people, including those the folks I said who were tenants of hers, said that she, that's when she started taking to drinking, 
And uh, she, she took to drink quite a bit and just really sort of lost a lot of her interest in a lot of the affairs there. Um, she does give, um, she gives the, uh, the old state bank to the city of Decatur. Uh, excuse me, she gives it to the American Legion. And the Legion later on gives it to the city of Decatur. But uh, so that's, that's another wonderful thing, another bequest that she did for the city. But um, in 1943, uh, she is, the story I heard, of course, it's not in the newspaper. That This is the story I heard from these tenants, said that she was drinking in bed and she had a cigarette and set fire to uh, a rug in the room. And um, she had to be rescued through the second story window. Uh, brought out. So a lot of uh, the things that we would love to have to know more about her life, a lot of her papers were uh, destroyed in that fire. She survived, um, but she did uh, she did lose a lot in that fire. Um, but she did uh, pass away in 1948. Um, she left a lot of money to the Episcopal Church uh, there in Decatur and, um, and to the state uh, um, organization of the Episcopal Church. So um, no children, so there's no one really to carry on her memory. You know, she didn't have a, you know, a child like how Joe Wheeler had Annie Wheeler to make sure everything got named after him. Uh, there's not really, it's very shortly after, you know, they didn't, they changed that name of Lelia uh, Cantwell Seton Hall of the Old State Bank. It was just called the Old Bank. Uh, so really, there's nothing really to tell you, uh, indicator, other than two streets. There's one called Seton Avenue. And there's another one uh, called Cleo, which was another person that was in her family. There was a, a street called Horton, but it's actually been, uh, it's, it's no longer, it's been vacated and re renamed. But uh, so anyway, that's, uh, that's why we don't know much about her. But I'm glad to have this opportunity to tell y'all a little bit about her story. And um, I'm told that I can uh, write a, an article about this for Alabama Heritage. So uh, keep a lookout for that. And uh Anyway, hopefully we'll have a few more tidbits and a few more photographs and uh, some things about her as well. So that's my presentation. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you so much, please, for joining me and thanking Mr. Right. Thank you. And thank you. And, and as you said, we have time for questions. This is both for our in-person audience. If you want to raise your hand, I can bring you the microphone, but also to our virtual audience. Uh, if you have any questions, you can post them in the comments and they'll come to my phone, so I'll be able to ask them for you. So are there any questions? I know you mentioned that um, her home is no longer there, so there's not, yeah. there's not even kind of that to kind of commemorate her. So how would you suggest that we try to commemorate her? Well, there are some public and semi-public lands that are on her old land. So I'd love to at least get some kind of a marker or something there. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, I think any number of causes in agriculture or um, women's, you know, women's issues, you know, you certainly could, could honor her in that way. But um, I don't know. I'm open to suggestions, but I think a, a good, there are several, there are several places where we could probably put a marker up that would be appropriate for her. This guy here had a question. I'm going to bring him the microphone so our live streamers can hear his question. Hey, John. Hey, Scott. Wondering about the Farmers Union board. Was she the only woman on that board at the time? I think she may have been, but I do know that the Farmers Union actually, uh, they were very progressive in that regard. They had a lot of women who were uh, elected to office, but I, I think she may have been the only woman on the board at that time. I know that... Um, I know that they certainly, uh, one thing that's interesting about the Farmers uh, Union, and I have to say, I didn't know a lot about them. I knew about the Grange and some of these predecessor unions, but the National Farmers Union, which is still around today, um, they did not have a women's auxiliary. They just, you know, women were members. And so that may have been what attracted her to the organization to begin with, too. So, but yeah, I'll check up on that for the article. <laughs> We have another question here at the back. Oh, how old was she when she died? How old was she when she died? I think she was about, oh, how old was she? I'd have to do the math. Uh, she's about 80. She had a pretty good long life. Let's see. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, 
it cut short, obviously, from, you know, drinking a little bit, from what I understand. Oh. Karen? Here's another in the back. Hey, John. Hey. You know, you discussed a lot about, like, the race relations mm -hmm. and how good she was with her tenants and stuff. But it never seemed like she ran up on opposition when it came to the men in that city. Mm -hmm. Like, men in that city often would chafe over you know, a woman having as much power as she managed yeah. to have. Yeah. How did she skirt that? Like that's, that seems that's a really suspiciously good. good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it really does. And I don't have an easy answer for that. I, I think that just the strength of her personality, she's like a force of nature, apparently. And maybe she had some dirt on some of these people. I don't know. Uh, but she really, uh, no, that's a good question. Um, I, of course, when she marries Colonel Evanson, he's very well respected but you know she's doing a lot of this stuff before uh, as a, as mrs wilder and she's not even a native you know she's from ohio for crying out loud and her uncle is uh um her uncle is a, was a member of the union league so i mean a lot of the you know i don't think she's getting invited to any udc parties this is one thing that i really see that's uh, that is interesting about her and is worth pursuing but it's just not written about a lot you know, I would love to see if there's something else there. She definitely seems to me like sort of an outsider. Uh, she does not, uh, she's not in those little cliques. You know, she's not a member, even though she's in the, the women's, um, you know, she's in the League of Women Voters by 1920, but she's not in, um, she's not in the benevolent society that built the hospital. She's not in a lot of the clubs, you know, like she said, she's not a club woman. She says that very prominently, like it's, I don't have time for clubs. So if it, you know, the women of the time, a lot of the society women of the time would take that as a deliberate snub. Uh, so yeah. And the men, I don't know. The only thing I can say is that, you know, because of, her success as a farmer and because of her um, contacts with political leaders that she'd cultivated over the years, I, I think they just, maybe, maybe they were afraid to butt up against her. And she also knew how to read those situations, you know, like if she's saying, Oh, I don't, uh, you know, back when suffrage is a real fight, she's not, she's not in the fight. You know, she waits until after, women actually are granted the right to vote to really double down on some of these issues. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I think she's just wily and savvy and just knows how to work a lot of these political situations to her advantage, but I don't know. That's a good question. All right. Well, thank you so thank much you. for telling us about Mrs. Edmondson and thank you to everyone for joining us both here and virtually. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all on March 29th for our book talk.